Hello, it's Scott Manley here. For almost as long as I have been making videos about the past, present and future of space science and rocket technology, one project has been waiting in the future. And now the first launch of SLS, Artemis 1, is almost upon us. We've seen the animations, we've read the stories, we've... Go. We have complained an awful lot about the management and the money and the expense. And if that's your thing, I have several other videos on what it took to get here. But I want to now really focus on the rocket itself. I want to go in close and look at all the details that everybody else misses. Sure, we know that it is currently the biggest rocket that is operational. And I say operational in that we expect it to fly. It has gone through so many tests, we are pretty sure it's going to work. And of course, some of the parts have actually flown before, such as the main engines, which were from the space shuttle. So for those of you that haven't been paying attention for the last decade, the core of the SLS has four RS-25 engines from the space shuttle. It's fueled by liquid hydrogen and oxygen. The core tank is about 8.4 meters diameter, 100 meters tall. Strapped to the side of that are a pair of five segment solid rocket motors, similar to the space shuttle, but one segment longer. On top of that, we have a second stage called the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. And on top of that, we have the Orion capsule and its service module. The service module is built by the European Space Agency and the capsule is built by Lockheed Martin. Finally, there's the launch abort tower on top designed to pull the capsule clear in an emergency and that's built by Northrop Grumman. So now let's start looking at things in more detail and I think it's actually good to start with the old parts. So let's look at the engines. Those four engines all previously flew on space shuttle. The oldest is the engine in the top right. That's engine serial number 2045. It first flew in 1998. The other engines can't boast quite as long a career. Engine 2058 flew uh, six times. 2056 flew four times. And engine 2060 has only flown three times. This will be its fourth and final. We've already seen the raw power of this team working together in the green run test where they, of course, fired the whole booster for a full duration. Actually, there were two green run tests. The first time it didn't quite get all the way through due to problems with one of the core auxiliary power units, but a second time they managed to get it right. The auxiliary power units are what provides the power to the engine's hydraulic system that allows them to gimbal. Now, on the space shuttle, the APUs were driven by hydrazine, which was carried in a separate tank. But for SLS, they are tapping off some of the uh, fluid pressure from inside, inside the engine and using that to drive the APUs, which can then, of course, provide thrust vectoring for the engine. Okay, so the next reused component are the solid rocket motors, and these are basically carried straight over from the space shuttle. Now, the big difference is that these are five segment motors, whereas the space shuttle only used four. So they are split into segments so that they can be transported across the country. And there's actually a bit of a joke about how uh, the size of the boosters on the space shuttle are related to the size of a horse's butt. And I'm sure a bunch of you want to look that up right now, but I have kind of ruined the punchline for you. So the booster segments were the first things that are stacked. These are actually where the SLS is held down to the pad. There are securing bolts in the bottom section. And first of all, they stack the boosters up and then they put the core stage down the middle and hang it off these boosters. So that's what holds it in place. At launch, these boosters will provide the majority of the thrust. Without these boosters, actually, the core stage is too heavy to lift off. Like it has just under, it has about 700 tons of thrust at launch and 850 tons of liquid oxygen in that core tank. The peak thrust on the boosters are about 1600 tons at launch, but the interior geometry will change the thrust profile. As it burns fuel, it will actually drop its thrust down to about 1,300 tonnes during max Q and then ramp back up to about 1,500 tonnes. Now, the extra booster segment allows them to generate about 100 tonnes more thrust than the space shuttle versions, but it doesn't really extend the burn time. And as with the main engines, these boosters also have a lot of shuttle history in there. Not, some of the segments are new, but many of them have pre previously flown on various shuttle flights. 
One of the cooler animations I've seen in recent weeks has been this numerical simulation from NASA Ames using very, you know, fancy comp computational fluid dynamics to model the flame temperatures and pressures that will you know, affect the pad and how they will interact with the flame diverter and hopefully not that tiny little green man standing in the T-pose down there because that would not be good for that person's health. The solid boosters also inherit all the capabilities they had on the space shuttle with the exception of being able to be recovered. Those are getting you know, dropped back in the ocean. The separation jets are in the same place. You can see them at the bottom you know, near close to the rocket. There's these old tubes pointing down. And at the front, you can see an array of four little holes here. Now, it's important to, well, it's interesting to realize that they're not actually pointed directly at the rocket. These things actually peel off sideways, just like they did on the space shuttle. It's not like Kerbal Space Program where they go out directly away from the rocket. They sort of go downwards at 45 degrees to each other. Okay, so let's now look at that large core stage. And while it is big orange fuel tank, it really is almost unrelated to the external tank that was used on the space shuttle. The, the main, you know, obviously the main uh, visual comparison is that orange foam, which is used for cooling, or sorry, for in thermal insulation, and more specifically to protect it from condensation on the exterior of the tank, which when ice falls down, it could potentially damage things. This big central booster accounted for the lion's share of development time and resources. It was the most complex thing they had to build up. Those boosters on the side, by the way, those were first tested in their five-segment form before SLS was even a thing. They were tested for Constellation, and they were probably almost ready to go back then. So this is a large 8.4 meter wide uh, tank section. The whole booster with the engine section is just under 100 meters tall. Now, if you look carefully at it, you'll see that there are light and dark areas in the uh, orange foam. And these actually mark different sections of the, the booster. So look, starting at the bottom, you can see the white engine section. That's the business end. Above that is the hydrogen tank. And that runs all the way up to that first horizontal band. Then there is an intertank section, and above that is the oxygen tank. So you can see there's a huge difference in the amount of hydrogen versus the amount of oxygen. But hydrogen is very low density. That huge tank section only accommodates 144 tons of liquid hydrogen, whereas the smaller oxygen section is about 840 tons of liquid oxygen. Now on the side of the booster, you can also see the liquid oxygen line coming down around the outside of the hydrogen tank. You know, you don't want to have that running through the middle of the hydrogen tank because then your liquid oxygen would freeze solid. The intertank section also includes room for a whole lot of electronics and stuff like that, but also it has a very important mechanical structure because the anchor forward anchor points for those boosters are in between those two tanks. So between those forward points and the aft points, those have to carry the 1,600 tons load into the central rocket so that the vehicle can fly, well, you know, without falling apart. This photo also shows the SLS from the side that the tower is from, so you don't usually see it from this angle. So if you look up towards the top, you can see some of the umbilicals that come into the core stage from the tower side, but you can't see the two main ones, which are fed from the aft service masts, which are basically the same design that are used for the space shuttle. These are designed to retract back very quickly and have doors that close to protect them against damage after the vehicle starts ascending. You've probably also noticed a whole lot of black and white squares. Those are painted onto the rocket so that cameras that are following the vehicle have known coordinates that they can track when they're post-processing. So they can actually view not just the motion of the rocket, but you see that they're actually painted onto the launch structure. So they can see how the vehicle moves relative to the structure or potentially how the structure is flexing under the forces of the launch. So the next step up on the launch vehicle is the launch vehicle stage adapter. And this tapers the rocket down from about 8.4 meters in diameter to about five meters. This is only for the first three launches where they are using the narrower second stage. They are eventually going to a larger second stage in the future. But for now, we're living with the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which was 
chosen mostly because it's basically a direct copy of a vehicle that's already flying on the Delta IV, uh, right? So the Delta IV Heavy has a five meter uh, upper stage. The upper tank on that is liquid hydrogen. The lower tank is liquid oxygen. And then there's an RL10 engine on the bottom there. And I'll be honest, this second stage is pretty undersized for what SLS is. I think it was used because it's a faster way to get the vehicle ready to fly. But the whole stack or the whole core booster is pretty much going to get up to orbital velocity within about 100 miles an hour. It's very close to orbital velocity. Then this stage will separate. It will give a little bit of a thrust to get itself up to orbital velocity. And then its main job is to push Orion upwards into translunar injection and send it on the way to the moon. And so yeah, on Artemis 1, this is what is going into orbit. We'll have the second stage, the ICPS, it will have the Orion spacecraft and the service module attached. So the Orion spacecraft looks a lot like an Apollo capsule, but it's significantly bigger. I think actually when it was designed, it was hoped that it could have like seven people in it so they could carry that many to the space station, right? But more importantly, Orion is designed with a much more complex life support system than say is used in SpaceX's Dragon or the Soyuz, right? This is something that in theory is going to be able to keep astronauts alive for weeks at a time. Now, the only thing is, that's not actually flying on Artemis 1. The environmental control and life support system isn't on this flight, so it's not going to get tested. But don't worry, there are plenty of other experiments of stuff that's actually going to get tested on this flight, including a whole bunch of CubeSats that are going to ride along. And I think my favorite is NEA Scout, which is going to be able to use a solar sail to guide itself and power itself to a rendezvous or at least a flyby of a near-Earth asteroid. But really, NASA is, of course, most interested in how... Orion performs. And this is going to be the first real deep space test flight for this spacecraft. They're telling us it's the deepest into space a human rated spacecraft has ever gone. And they have forgotten the ascent module from Apollo 10, which was shot into deep space. But I, I get NASA is excited. So this is going to go out and it's going to swing by the moon and then get kicked up into a higher orbit for a few weeks and it'll then encounter the moon and come back. It's going to spend about six weeks in space. This is actually much longer than the first flight that's going to have crew on board. Artemis 2 is just going to be a free return trajectory around the moon. This though is a you know, distant retrograde orbit which will allow them to really test their systems including of course the service module with its uh, engine which comes from a space shuttle. So the service module has a sort of interesting history because it's actually built by the European Space Agency. Uh, in the International Space Station, the European Space Agency built the ATV, the Automated Transfer Vehicle, and it was a spacecraft ferry. They flew a few of those and declared that they had, you know, satisfied their commitment to the International Space Station project. Then NASA said, hey, could you use some of that ATV technology to push our Orion spacecraft around? And sure enough, that's what they ended up building. So anyway, after the whole six week flight, Orion will return to Earth. It will cut and land off of the west coast of the US. It has an ablative heat shield, which is rated for return from the moon, which means it has to handle much higher temperatures and energies. Its uh, heat shield is actually more closely related to, say, Apollo than what we saw in the space shuttle, for example. So anyway, after it lands, it'll be recovered and they'll look at the experiments and, and whatnot. But I actually skipped over one important part, of course, the launch abort system, which, of course, isn't that important on an uncrewed mission, but it will be on Artemis 2. And there's a lot of interesting stuff about this. So you'll see that it has this big tower sticking out with these four nozzles. And you might naively think that there's like four rocket motors in there. No, that's actually one single rocket motor that's actually sh fired upwards and then the flames or the exhaust gets diverted down to provide the thrust in the correct direction. But then for steering, there's another solid rocket motor and a series of eight valves that open and close to provide the steering or the thrust, the thrust in the correct direction. 
So these valves open and close at incredibly rapid speeds to make sure the thing is you know, flying in the correct direction when it's firing. Like, to be clear, these aren't valves that are letting the fuel in, these are valves that are controlling the flow of the rocket exhaust from this solid rocket motor. That is a pretty hot and harsh environment, would I would imagine, for valves to operate in. The launch abort system also has a third rocket motor that's used to separate the tower from the Orion capsule afterwards, so that they can actually safely deploy the parachutes. So currently the launch is scheduled for early on Monday morning. Uh, it's entirely possible it gets delayed for all sorts of reasons. After all, it is SLS, but I will absolutely be watching because when it goes, it will be spectacular. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.